This is LS, and you're on Thorin's YouTube channel, so cut the Western shit. Okay, this is episode 41 of Narrative Wake. Kelsey's got that good lighting back. She's going for that. So what she's trying to do now, okay, is because, you know, in the modern day, you know, not everything's going great for everyone. You know, we're all at different points in our careers. So she's trying to recreate some nostalgic feelings by creating like one of those, you know, the old school, like Polaroid, like Kodak pictures. They sort of like, they become yellow, but in a way it makes the picture more special. You know, you remember it more fondly when you see, you go, oh, great times, you know, but look at how time has sort of taken its toll on that. So I, I like it. It's a good aesthetic for you, Kelsey. Sort of The Simpsons. That's what you reminded me of right now. I'm a big fan of the sepia sort yes, of historical feel. Totally exactly. Like there you go. Plus, to be fair, you actually do, in a way, remind me a bit of Lisa Simpson. You've got that sort of, like, you've got a bit of a do-gooder in you, but there's a bit of edge there at the same time. Sure. She's, she's what, eight, nine, depending on the episode. So that, that's about correct. Yeah. She transcends time more. That's the thing. That's actually the thing about The Simpsons, obviously, and it's all cartoons. It never really made sense, is it? Like, they just go for like 20 years and they're re they also are just referencing shit from ages ago. It's like, but you're still nine. It's like, nah, don't worry about that. <laughs> so, and, and having like, you know, fucking Mike Tyson in an episode like 20 years ago, like, this doesn't really make sense, but whatever. Keep going. So, our guest for this episode, it's been on past episodes. It's Irene, the riot caster you know and love, or at least we do, because keeps coming back on the show some of the other ones just one and done you know we never know if we never know if they're coming or going if they've just gone out for cigarettes for five minutes who knows what about my my lighting i got the uh the ghastly white and going for the casper look here yes. you know reflecting the sun back at it that's always been my thing you know pasty and frail never fail that's kind of like my motto you've done that classic mistake that i did when i actually finally got like an apartment that wasn't, you know, like just facing a fucking tree or something wherever I was before, which is I thought, oh, natural light will be the less light of all, which shows you've had no experience in show business, by the way. Like, there's, a reason why, there's a reason why, in, you know, in Hollywood, they just fucking film in a set that has no natural lighting and they put like... Getting flame for my lighting, come on. They put entirely fake lighting oh. in, they put makeup on oh. you. Here we go, here we go. Oh, he's proper lighting now. Yeah, not bad. Yeah, there you go. There you go. There you go. I can, I can almost not see the reflection of your forehead in your forehead. So that. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just the oily guy, man. It's like, uh, I always tell my makeup artist that she's taking it away. She's like, you're really shiny. And it's like, because I'm a star. I'm a star. And they just had to dull me every time. So. Okay. Right. So to start this episode off. Right, let's get your take on the siren since we've had a whole bunch of different guests on and every time you have someone on because the main dis topic of discussion that everyone's obsessed with is still like the different meta of the summer split and how different it's been right first of all what have your general thoughts been on it and where do you think we're at now uh so my general thoughts are it's been a complete shit show in terms of there was the funnel meta there was like the mage bottom everybody's got to learn this stuff bruisers for like mid and bot and then smite mids so teams had to like, you only get so much practice. And so if you're indexing on like one strategy more than the others, you're going to start favoring it. And if you indexed in the one that wasn't as strong, then you're playing catch up. Because if funnel ends up being the best strategy and you practice more smite mids or you practice more of the mages or even just played standard, it, maybe it's something that like you have to kind of change what your team is doing because not only did you have to practice the right strategy in terms of the meta, you had to practice the right strategy for your team. Because there's some teams where it's like, oh, you ain't going to be running Funnel. <laughs> not that, not like that. It's like, when Echo Fox did, I'm like, why are you putting Dardock on Braum and Alistar? He's like legitimately your second best or best player, depending on his performance in the game. So I, I just thought it was an overall shit show. And in order to like talk about now, I want to say like Marksmen are coming back. The, the patch that's about to hit in 8.15 is like buffs to marksman items in terms of cost. You hit your power spikes earlier. So teams that didn't fuck around with the whole meta and actually just like played standard a whole bunch, like Team Liquid, are going to do even better. So it's going to be marksman again. No more like 2018 ADC lull. And it's going to be, once again, serious business for the bot lane. Okay. Right, Kelsey, do you agree? Is NA going to give up this obsession with some of the silly things they've been doing for the last six weeks? And the thing is, is that... And hey, this past week, I don't think anyone played anything but an ADC um, yeah. in the ADC position. So they're already, I mean, they, they didn't really move that far from it compared to other regions like uh, EU <laughs> or yeah. 
or even LCK. Uh, so LPL and NA stayed probably the most standard. So I think the the overall feeling that I have about moving back though is 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 so weird to me. Like the the new patch coming back where they're re I mean, they're, they're decreasing the cost of some of the crit, crit items a bit, and they're they're changing the overall power spike of the, some of the crit items. It just makes me wonder, okay, so so what was the purpose of all of this? What was the, the idea in the grand scheme of this? Because I thought that they would at least, you know, let it go for a split before they, they kind of went back to the crit items. And so yeah. that's, like, kind of where I am right now, where I'm questioning, because we were moving back anyway. Like, even if, okay... We understand how the the patch cycle works. They're not going to start looking at the next patch until two weeks ahead, and at that time, like they're already launching a patch, whatever. But even going back, if you look at like two weeks before, which is probably at about the time that they were like fine tuning this patch to release, you you knew that more and more people were playing ADCs. More and more people were playing ADCs in almost every region, and. Then they're, they're, they're re- rebuffing the crit items. So to me, it's just very weird overall that we're, we're doing this because I would assume that if Riot wanted this design decision, and even if maybe we can debate whether or not it was intentional that we have non-ADCs in the bot lane, it was something that they had talked about wanting, like almost uh, euphemistically or just philosophically, it would be nice if we could shake up the metal and everything wasn't so defined, etc, etc. So maybe it wasn't intentional in this patch, but it, it came out anyway, and it's like, okay, this is this this could be a happy thing for us. But they're not letting it breathe, because I think in part all the backlash. Um, so I think that it's, it's, it's a little bit interesting to me, because I feel like so much of the standings has been established based on all the random stuff, and then maybe for the last two weeks of LCS and LCK and every other thing, we're, we're going to have a reversion back to basically spring meta almost. We even, even we see like some of the mages that were popular in spring coming back, like the Orianas, um, the Aziers, things like that, just, just returning. So to me, it just feels really weird overall that, that summer split was even a thing. So I guess it depends a lot on what happens and what we see on stage in the coming week. But that's that's my overall feeling on it. Um, I can actually uh, talk a little bit more about this because I was on the playtest team in 2014 at the end. And patch cadence is really, really interesting because if live patch is patch like 1.0 and the PBE is 1.1, I'm playing 1.2 on the playtest team. So I'm two patches ahead of live. And then what happens is when 1.1 hits um, uh, live, then I'm on 1.3. And then 1.1 hits pro a week later. So when 1.1 hits pro and I'm tuning 1.3 and 1.2 is set to come out in a week, I get like four days to tune 1.2 before 1.1 swaps over from pro. So it's like, it's very difficult to be like 1.1 hits pro. Oh my God, they're playing all ADCs and 1.2 has ADC buffs. I have like five days to like tune 1.2 for live and then that's going to be like it, it's not enough time to actually run enough tests and a lot of the times that's like over the weekend as well where people aren't working on the play test team right you aren't doing iterations so you have like monday tuesday maybe friday uh if you're watching like eu and stuff like that and they do keep their ears to the ground on those regions so i i feel like what happens is you release a change and then you see it a week later in pro and you don't get to react to it because your next patch is already semi-locked and then you re- can react to it another patch later. So think of these marksman changes. These are ones where uh, five weeks ago, you're going, man, there's all these mages bottom. Two weeks later, another patch comes out, and you go, okay, we're trying to tune this. Two weeks later, another patch comes out, and then a week later, it hits pro. And that's the one where you're going, eight fi- that's 8.15, right? Because I was working on 8.15 as a play tester four weeks um, ago, right? And so that's that's kind of how it works. So there's a delay in terms of being able to react to metas in pro. And that that does suck, but that's just kind of how things are. That's why like when Zoe comes out, people are like, this champion's like okay or it's nutty or whatever. Then it sees pro. You don't really get to react to how strong Zoe is for about three weeks. 
So that that's kind of how it goes in terms of patch cadence. It's unfortunate, but it's just how things work. Okay. Yeah, and I am aware of that, and that's why I said like even I think even on eight point one three though we saw after Rift Rivals everyone freaked out uh, in NA and said we can't play this anymore. But then even the next week after Rift Rivals, you had LCK playing way more ADCs because they got dicked by ADCs uh, from the LPL teams, and then so you had the reaction from NA and EU who watch LCK thinking oh okay so. Maybe it's not that bad, and that's that's like three or three to four weeks in advance, and then eight point one five still comes out. Uh, I also think that even ignoring and disregarding people playing more and more ADCs, it just seems a little weird that Riot would shake up the meta so severely uh, in between the splits, and then see the backlash, and then decide, okay, the best course of action is to try to revert it uh, well, to an extent. I think it's so, because a lot of marksman players just lost their identity, right? Because if you're a mid laner, you identify as a mid laner. People don't usually identify as like a full on assassin player. They'll play whatever's good. Same thing with junglers. Supports have played enchanters and like uh, tanks and stuff. And marksmen have just always been, I'm the ranged guy who shoots stuff. And that was just an uncomfortable change for marksmen. I mean, maybe they're a little spoiled, right? Like they've been able to be like the, the most important character in the game late game for years. And so I, I think it's kind of just being like, marksman player lost their identity and you can't play ranged marksman in any other role so they kind of just got deleted from the game for a lot of people's minds but like you said it did kind of come back up but I, I also think there's another compounding factor here for why they're coming back and that's because you play a mage bottom lane you can play a talon mid an aurelia mid you can play a physical damage mid laner and there aren't enough ap junglers or top laners to really allow you to be like i'm diversifying my damage palette so if i'm running talon mid i'm going to run swain bottom or vladimir bottom right and now there's not enough physical damage mid laners in the meta uh, that are good that allow you to run mages bottom lane so you'd like over index on magic damage if you go for a mage bottom so people just went back to marksman and then control mages mid and yeah people just remembered that Aeons ago in season one, people realized the best way to balance a composition is to have this type of champion in this lane in this 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 position. So, yeah, I mean, yep. like we were talking about this on way back when LS was on. It's like, yeah, eventually people will go back to this. Uh, but I do think so. Riot like overcorrecting for this type of thing is very strange. But mostly, I feel that way because. Obviously, most of the standings have kind of been decided in a lot of different regi regions by the time that this patch will hit uh, pro play, right? So teams that have qualified on playing mage bottom suddenly, like, crit ADCs are pretty good. And <laughs> so so what does this mean for playoffs? What does this mean for world's qualification, etc.? So that's that's kind of the weird thing for me. Yeah, I always have that issue, too, because then when you get to worlds, it's like, well, this team was really good at, we'll use Funnel as an example, right? They were really good at Funnel, and now that doesn't exist anymore. It's like, oh, that that sucks, or these champions were really good. I think this has happened at Worlds once or twice, where there was enough of a shift from playoffs patch to Worlds that it wasn't really the best team in each region at this strategy. So you're like testing a split push team at team fighting, and it was like, eh, it, it was rough. But also I think there's something to be said about um, Marksman being overcorrected for, because not just the pro game, but the solo queue game, I think like in terms of win rates, like the highest win rate marksmen or bot laners are like Cassiopeia, Velkaz, Mordekaiser, Vagar, Heimerdinger. Like there's a lot in there and they've been slowly buffing things like Jinx and Twitch to try and make them better. So I, I feel like it's just been pro, no, pro players. And this has always kind of stood out to me for marksmen in general. It's better and you're going to look better playing a marksman with a good team than in solo queue where your team is not coordinated because as a marksman your defensive tools are usually not your own and you have to rely on positioning but when you're in pro play when your defensive tools aren't your own your support knows their job your jana knows their job your nami knows their job your tanks know their job in solo queue people are just apes going everywhere they don't know what's going on and you have to fend for yourself so you have less defensive tools available to you and that's why people who play marksman in solo queue feel really frustrated when their champions aren't good or at least like passable because they don't feel self-sufficient and they have agency and they are so reliant on other people. But I, I think that's kind of why we're seeing the correction. So, Okay. So 
as you referenced earlier, the team you talked about already is Team Liquid. They're the number one team in the league. Obviously, they were the champions last split. They weren't always top of the league, though, this time. like They definitely had their times where they were never bad, admittedly, but they had times where they were wavering a little bit. Last few weeks, they've come on strong. What do you think's changed for Team Liquid? I think that the bottom lane has synergized a little bit better. Like The two infamous games of Vladimir from Double Lift, uh, I just don't think it fits the team. And I also think that marksman players who tried to play mages, it's just completely different instincts. Right? It was the difference between like double lift playing Vladimir and like Ryu playing Vladimir. Because it's double lift is a marksman player playing Vladimir and playing at bottom lane. And Ryu is a Vladimir player playing bottom lane. So he's somebody who actually plays the champion. I think we we're at a point where it was just more important to understand the champion than and their job than understand what the role demanded. So Vladimir is supposed to buy space for the team. He's supposed to go in and create space. And marksmen are supposed to use the space that's purchased by their team. And so Vladimir is completely almost an opposite in terms of what he wants to accomplish in team fights. And so they kind of departed from that. It's been just marksmen for double lift and Olay. And I think there was a little bit of a breaking point for them. I think there was a lot of turmoil in the team. I think Olay's had some issues like emotionally uh, ever since MSI and him and double lift have had a lot of conflicts. They talked about like a love hate relationship. And it's even funny now because after their games, if you watch their camera, Double lift gets up, Olay gets up, and they turn and they shake each other's hands. They're business partners. They're literally like pleasure playing bottom lane with you. It's not a hug. It's not a high five. It's nothing like that. It's just like pleasure doing business with you. So it's kind of like a working relationship. And I think because they're winning, that's going to be even better. Because if you're losing and you have a relationship like that, where like the only reason I like you is because you're good and we're winning, then now he has a reason. They have a reason to kind of like each other because they're winning games. So I feel like if Team Liquid starts losing, that might fall apart. But I think what happened was Double Nole started getting a little bit more synergized. Um, and that sounds like it's dissynergy, but I think like being able to call each other on your shit is synergy. And that's the difference between being nice and being actually like looking out for each other in terms of improvement. So that's kind of my take on it. I think also a big thing is games have gone a bit longer. And I don't necessarily think that Team Liquid's early game is a world beater. Um, I think that Team Liquid are, are are much better, and especially after MSI, at like the way that Poe Belter plays. I think has changed a lot um, in terms of he plays much more for mid pressure. We're seeing like his mid turret go enemy mid turret go down first more often uh, for Poe Belter. Where enemy mid is roaming off of priority and Poe Belter is, is pushing down mid turret and then bot lane is pushing so you're playing like the slow game of trading two sides for one where enemy teams are maybe grouping top or going for for one lane trade and then team liquids like mid and bot will be will be stronger as the game progresses and then they're they're just good at closing on that so i think that 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 has helped a bit because i think teams overall are just getting better at defensive play or reactive play where they're waiting in jungle for enemy teams to go in and lay vision and they collapse. And uh, we're seeing a lot more of that type of play in NA. So I think that, that that's helped Team Liquid a lot. Because actually what you were saying there, Zyrene, about like when they were, it's not that they were like obviously a bad team. They were still like pretty high in the rankings. But obviously the expectation was that they should be one of the best teams. They should mm. be winning, etc. Especially when you blow MSI and you come back to your region where it's like, well, at least we're the best in NA. I actually was thinking something similar where when I was seeing some of the losses, it looked like not necessarily everyone in the team appreciated everyone else. The interesting thing for me is because obviously now we have transitioned back to like, you can just play the old comps anyway and you can go back to what everyone knows they're doing. I really wonder what would have happened if that hadn't have been the case because Team Liquid bizarrely was one of the few teams in the league that didn't attempt to use any subs this split. I mean, as much as everyone jokes about like, Steve's bought everyone, and obviously they've had a long-time academy project there with a bunch of players, in, including Joy, the guy they brought in for MSI. They didn't actually test that, though. They didn't They didn't take a gamble and bring one of them up and have them play something just for a specific comp or something, you know? So, I mean, it's, the gamble's paid off, but I was, I was really wondering if that was going to be the breaking point at some point, you know? Mm. I'm unsure, but, like, I don't... I, it, it's weird, because... We're talking about Team Liquid like not being maybe as dominant as they were in spring, but keep in mind their spring split record was twelve and eight. They're actually they actually have a way better record now yes. than they did in spring. So they, at the end of spring is when they got all their shit yes. together because they've had to play 
they didn't get a, like a first round bye, right? No, it was no. Echo Fox and Hundred Thieves. They had to play at the very beginning and play against Cloud Nine, knock them out, play Echo Fox and all that. So I think Team Liquid are actually better than they were in spring because they've had time to synergize, which is of course what you would expect. But going to MSI and getting kind of I wouldn't say smashed, but like they had this fucking big wake up call versus Splice. That was actually the most typical NA game well, you could ever Rivals, have. But yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry. That's yes, what I, that's yeah. what I meant. Rift Travels definitely is the wake up call. Because MSI <laughs> was a big. I, I like to forget that that was not a important tournament, you know, because it was important to me. But Rift Rivals in the middle of the split was a big wake up call for them to just kind of get their shit together. Because MSI, MSI was all over the place. It was like double lift and Olay, and the fact that Joey had to play that was something where it was like, is this like you said the breaking point? Is that where? Like, oh, they're going to get somebody else. Is Ole going to be able to, like, come back stronger? And I've kind of yet to see the full return from that. But I think that what they've done is they've made it so, like I said, there's a working relationship where that may not happen again. And it's all about talking about what you need. And I think what Ole needs is he needs to at least be, like, appreciated and accepted in the team. And, and instead of, like, maybe berated or, like, put down. Because, you know, Double F can be pretty aggressive with his feedback, sure, yeah. I think. Right? Pretty abrasive. Um, but if Ole is able to build up resilience for that, then I think that it can work and that they'll look better. You know, that's where I almost wanted to just be like, can someone like consult with Ole? Like, I, I don't know if he just does, didn't used to watch NLCS before he came over because like the guy he's playing with is literally infamous <laughs> for all his former teammates saying like, yeah, if he ever loses trust in you, then he just basically like takes over and just doesn't give a fuck anymore. It's like, I probably wouldn't bench myself at the first international tournament we go to together, you know, like I could see that maybe playing out badly, you know, like, <laughs> I, well, <laughs> yeah, come on. Of, like my favorite, uh, NA team moment, I think, just to, that I've seen recently that kind of summarizes the expectations that people have in NA teams for how feedback is delivered was the recent like TSM Legends episode where Mithy says, let's just be honest with each other and be lie. harsh. And then they spend like five minutes explaining this concept and and saying like, oh, I hear all these passive aggressive and I know and I feel and I'm empathetic. So I understand what it's like. No, nope, just, just, you guys want to win games? Just say stuff. And then, like, then I hear Olay doesn't really like the way that Double Lift delivers feedback and all this other stuff. And it's just, yeah. sometimes well, you right. just got to like, rip off the band aid, you know? Well, I, I'm sitting fair, here. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, yeah. go on, go on, Matt. I'm sitting here going, we're in summer split. It's almost over. You have two weeks left, three weeks left. It's like, do you haven't changed anything about the team. Where the fuck is the coaching staff in this? Why is Mithy the one saying this? Why aren't the coaches saying this? Like, this is a this is an issue that needs to be taken care of by coaching staff. Like, players shouldn't hate each other. They should hate the coaching staff because the coaching staff are the ones that are kind of forcing these conversations to happen. The coaching staff should only be should almost be like a responsibility tank, right? You should be tanking the responsibility of making sure that your players are synergizing and working together. And that means even if they have a relationship where you guys are giving each other direct fucking feedback. And you need to facilitate that happening. So it, I, that was actually really appalling to me. Like you said, it's just pretty basic concept of giving direct feedback and being honest because it feels like TSM don't want to like rub each other the wrong way. And also, I think Double, Double have talked about this in his video. It was um, loss aversion when he was talking about uh, having things taken away in League of Legends. Yes. But I want to apply it to um, playing playing on stage. Because loss aversion for professional players, I think, is is bullshit, and you shouldn't be doing that. Because people, like, I want to just, I'll use a random example. Just, like, think of a random professional player. This will fit a lot of them. Is they don't like winning as much as they hate losing. They hate losing. And you know, so they try to avoid a, that. There was actually a study done uh, that I, I read an article about Zyrene. I mean, as usual, I didn't read the actual fucking study. Because <laughs> no one read, you read the article that's written by a journalist who himself only read the abstract. Yes, you, you don't really actually read that. So what, I'm not claiming I actually know what it said, but the gist of it was that apparently when they did tests on people who were sports fans, they actually got four times more like grief from their t favorite team losing than they did from their favorite team winning. Yeah. Well, you'd think it'd be the opposite, wouldn't you? Well, you're a fan of the team potentially because you like them winning. So it's the standard for you, right? It's the norm. But I want to use Double Lift as an example because he's the opposite where I think Double Lift doesn't hate losing as much as he loves winning. 
because this motherfucker had double lifts meme fast trophy case. He didn't win shit forever. You do know, by the way, so it's every usually time he the, wins, it's actually it's usually the case that the people who are considered assholes of the Dardocks of the world, that's usually the main reason they manifest that way because they, it's kind of like, think about when you're a kid. We all know there's some kid who plays like sports when you're really young and they haven't yet learned about teamwork and stuff and they just rage out when they're losing but they rage at their teammates. They're not raging at the other team for beating them or themselves for doing bad. That's what they can't handle is like they, they just have to win, you know. It's like, and sure, there's negative elements to that but what's sad is if you could channel it in the right way, obviously there's a positive aspect to that. You know, that's like that's a, that's a drive. Not everyone has that. Yeah, but it's it's just for me though. Like this this complaint was, I being an American, like I can totally sort of sympathize with that feeling. Is let's just be direct, right? And so I feel like this is a problem that probably has manifest itself in a lot of NA teams. Um, and so I imagine that that's uh, getting around that is one of the ways that people succeed in North America. Just ha finding ways to be direct with your teammates and not have them uh, use that as an excuse not to perform. You know? Yeah, you need okay. direct. You need direct conflict um, and healthy conflict because a lot of teams will have unhealthy conflict where somebody is not being constructive with their feedback, criticism, or the way that they deliver it. And then there's a way to do it in a healthy manner. But then I think a lot of teams just avoid conflict. I think players, yes. uh, a lot of League of Legends pros, just are averse to having conflict in the game. Right. So I, I think that's just a big issue that they run into is they're too polite because they're used to, you know, playing solo queue, wanting to just, you know, oh, we'll go to the next game, different teammates, all that, instead of like actually giving people feedback. Because people take it personally as well. That's the other thing, yes. as well as taking feedback. You can't take that shit personally. Right. If you take it personally as like a critique of yourself, then, then I can't help you there. Like that's something that you have to work on. No, what's hilarious is like what Kelsey's saying there. That is actually like the t famous thing that you see in all the reality shows on the American ones. That's how you can tell poor, young, naive Mithy, who, by the way, all the European teams he's played in were the ones where like, were they really coached? I can't really say, you know, like <laughs> they, a lot of the players had a lot of say, you know, they worked out a lot of shit themselves in all the teams he was in. And to be fair, like he literally, he's one of those players where, I mean, he was even banned for toxicity. He's one of those players where he's just born in that world. Like, you know, he's like fucking Bane. That was like the world he was spawned into. So he comes out now to America and obviously everyone's talking with like the terminology of like fucking couples counseling. Like now Steve, Kathy hears you and she, she empathizes with how you feel, but she's frustrated and she needs to communicate. You know, like he's just like, what the fuck is this shit? Like, just, let's just talk. But obviously, yeah, you can't go too far the other way either. You can't just be straight flaming each other. The problem here is, this is another area where I have to tell you, Koreans have not in any way solved anything. Like, they didn't like sit down with counselors. Stuff. They again just have an OP cultural advantage, which is in their culture, they have two factors, right? One, you'll see this in LCK, even the best players do not complain when benched. So as a result, coaches actually use subs as a way to like, send a message to the player who fucked up that he fucked up. Like, what they'll do is they'll say, like, listen, I didn't like the way you played out, like, you know, the vision control in this game. This might even be in a scrim, by the way. And they'll say, right, so I'm going to put the sub in for the next game. So, like, please watch what I tell him to do, you know? And the whole point is, it's not a punishment. Like, they're not saying, like, listen, you're not in anymore. Like, he's the fucking starting jungler now. Their actual goal eventually is you're going to learn the lesson and come back and be the starting jungler. But mm -hmm. it's, like, it's quite a clever system. And But the crucial aspect that is different, as you alluded to at the end there, is... The difference is, I think if you try that with a Westerner, even if you told them all of that, they would take it personally. They'd be like, what, so you think that guy's better than me? Like, you know, like, it wasn't my fault that it happened. Like, the, the bottom laner mm -hmm. was fucking up. That's the problem. I feel like they, not because they have the natural, like, you have to respect the hierarchy and stuff, you know? I, I, that's where I feel like, as much as I'd love to, if you could try and make that work in the West, I don't know if it would, to be honest. Yeah, there was a, a, a bit tricky. There was an Echo Fox game where I think it was Echo Fox versus C9 where Licorice just, like, farmed Hooney really hard. Yes. And then I saw Hooney and he was really down and he was like, Coma would have benched me for that. Right? He, he knew after that <laughs> performance that he, he was like, like Hooney, who's like basically the most confident player that you could have okay. besides like maybe a Dardock or something like that. Self-confident. Yes. He was he was really down and he was like, even though they won the game, he was like, Coma would have benched me for that. Like, I wouldn't be it's starting the way tomorrow. Coma's become like the little conscience in his head. It's just <laughs> become like... So 
Am I bench coach? And they're just like, no, why would you be? Like, oh, I, sh- I should be though, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> you I mean, bench yourself at that point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I-, I see where you're coming from where it's like the hierarchy respecting the benching itself and then maybe the player is not really getting the lesson. But at the same time, I think that there is a niche in, in that sort of mentality where it might even be more effective in the West, right, to bench a player where it's like, oh, you, you think that I'm better than this guy, What I, that, that this guy's better than me, or whatever, and then, like, if the player is ending up on the sideline and having to watch the game as a spectator, it gets to a point where he can't necessarily, in his head, just, like, he has to sort of witness the game or he has to sort of understand the game, but you have to make him re- you the bot. You have to make him like see what the other player is doing differently. Sure. But I do think that at a point that if like coming in with that chip on your shoulder, it's like, what is this guy doing better than me? Rather than just like auto respecting the hierarchy, will will can actually be more effective um, mm. in that scenario. Mm. We found the the C nine fan in the uh, in the call. She, I she mean, I don't even sh- necessarily <laughs> buy into the idea that these guys were benched for like attitude problems or whatever. I mean, I don't, I don't know the full story. So, uh, it sounds like there was some fuckery on yeah. that. Like, all that needs to be said is this: like, what are the odds sixty percent of the team was just like bad attitudes overnight? And it's like, well, we have to bench them all. It's like, come on, if there's one player I'd understand, but, you know, there's some fuckery yeah. there. Right, anyway, anyway, since oh, go ahead, go since ahead. we started talking about. Team Liquid. TSM. <laughs> why, don't we, why don't we transition to TSM then? So, obviously, they're a team where, right, coming into the split, Zyrene, I actually know a lot of people thought, like, oh, the first split was just them figuring shit out. Obviously, they've got fabulous players in theory. Actually, a lot of people I know, experts, were saying they'll be one of the stronger teams in the summit. Like, to be fair, obviously, the meta aspect's been very different for everyone. There's been a lot of turmoil. But as the split went on, you know, they, they were looking like a, a week ago, like it was starting to get decent, you know, like maybe things were going somewhere. What can you say now? Because obviously, obviously they're not making worlds. Obviously the entire thing's been something of a failed experiment. Where do you come down on TSM now? Oh God. Um, I mean, they, they still can potentially make worlds. Like they had to flip a switch. <laughs> I mean, maybe they, they bring in like Weldon and stuff and every, everything gets solved again. You know, the snake oil. Sometimes sometimes your snake does need oiling. I'm just saying, if a yes. snake oil salesman comes sure. along, sometimes your snake might need oiling. Um, and I, I think TSM, the biggest issue that they're having is they adopted you know, Sven and Mithy, and in order to get them, they had to pick up a new jungler. And so they got Mike Young and, and Grig. And it, it's really the fact that they've now picked up a lot of the old G2 bottom lane problems. Like they actually came with them. Surprise, surprise. And now you have this issue where everybody on the team is kind of playing for different objectives. And I want to kind of talk about as a jungler, I want to use C9 as like the antithesis here for TSM. When TSM brings on a new jungler, the jungler is taught to play around the lanes. And then all the lanes kind of want the jungler. In C9, whether it's Medios or it's Sven Skarin or even just like, even when High <coughs> played jungle for them for a tiny bit, right? And then you had Blabber and Contracts. When C9 gets a new jungler, the team plays around the jungler. It's not the jungler having to play around the team. And TSM, I think, have the philosophy. I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know who's putting it in the team culture or if it's the way they think the game should be played in terms of like optimization. I and mean, well, granted, they have won a lot of championships, right? So it's worked sure. for them in the past. Having the jungler play to the lanes is something that I think right now is a hindrance to you. I think having the teams play around the jungler is better, especially in this world of like scuttle crabs. Like being able to shove your lane and get jungle priority is way more important than having a jungler come in and go in for ganks because Tracker's Knife doesn't exist anymore. And I think that hurts Bjergsen in terms of vision and making calls because you don't have early game vision or as much. So having an aggressive jungler that you can pair up with and go into the jungle and find the other jungler is way more effective. But I think they're trying to use Grig as a tool instead of using everybody on the team to enable Grig. And I don't think he's a, also a big carry for the team because I don't think they've enabled him to be so. Um, that That's kind of the issue. But base races aside, okay. you know, I think this is kind of the, the, the deep-rooted problem. Okay, Kelsey, so obviously this is one of your favorite axes to grind is the jungle position in TSM. Now, what I've got to update everyone on, in case everyone doesn't keep up to date on interviews, okay, is as usual, Kelsey, it's bloody arseholes like you and me with our fake narratives still plying them year after year. Because you know what? Every interview I see with a TSM player, I learn 
more and more information. Like, for example, they've never told junglers to play tanks. They've never told junglers to play around the lanes. They've never told their junglers to play passively. In fact, when they come in the team, I'm told, they tell their junglers, play aggressive champs. Do what you want to do, you know. Their coach obviously can't be doing it because he's a different coach now. Reginald isn't as hands-on, so it can't be him. Bjergsen's just a good guy, so please stop talking shit on him. <laughs> Double if's not in the team anymore, and Haunts is the best player ever. I mean, basically, Zyron said that. Didn't obviously, that's Whoa! Like, <laughs> just, just me and BM on the last one. I thought I'd make it funny. Right, but look, okay, you see the point I'm making here. As usual, right, they still to this day deny this is the case at all, but they're now on, like, you know, like the fifth dude in a row. And even better, this guy wasn't even, like, the whole split juggler. They had the Mike Young guy, and they were like, he's a project for the future. We're developing him. They developed him straight to their bench and brought in an to- even less well-known guy. So, Kelsey, come on. Pick up the old reins of the traditional narrative that we've gone through. What do you think's going on? So, I like I liked the way that Irene phrased it, because I think it it makes sense from a, an outsider perspective that the jungler is like forced flight around the lanes. But when you watch a lot of the TSM games from from the past, it, it almost feels like less specific than that, right? Where their idea of playing around the jungler is I'm Bjergsen, I'm going to push out mid, jungler can do whatever he wants. But then there's no communication on right. the jungler goes and invades the enemy buff. Bjergsen's not with him, like he dies. There's actually, statistically speaking, TSM junglers are incredibly likely to die um, right by, if they're playing right by, regardless of whether they're playing blue side or red side, right at the, uh, right by the blue side race camp, like where Bjergsen should be. It's a very statistically likely place for TSM junglers to die um, in, in generals. So it just means that even if Bjergsen has the lane pushed out, he's not necessarily roaming to assist his jungler. They're not necessarily playing as a team off of Bjergsen's priority. Um, it, it's more like they have this idea of Bjergsen has the priority, the jungler can do what he wants, but they don't execute past that point. Uh, so to me, that's, that's a very strange disconnect between like the center of the map, where you almost think, okay, you have your bot lane duo, you have your top lane who kind of does whatever he's on an island and then you have your mid jungle duo i feel like tsm have never really had a mid jungle duo um you know so. though like to be fair this is an example where listen i'll give i'll, I'll give leeway to the tsm players maybe none of them ever do say this explicitly maybe they never even like try to pressure the person somehow they just naturally develop in that way every time could be but this is a great example of something i've experienced many times when i've done analysis in cs or desks right which is a player will come up to you and they'll complain like oh you're saying that our team does this but that's a lie you know we don't try to like play passive on that area and like i say to them this like listen it may well be that, like, the very specifics of, like, who's co- making that call or whatever, I might not know that because I'm not in the team, but, like, from the outside, this is an observable fact that this thing is happening. So, really, it's not that important, like, the specific data. It's, it's the fact it keeps happening, and if it happens and it loses you games, I'm sorry, it, you're not really, like, proving me wrong by going, yeah, but it's not actually me that says that, though. It's like, well, that mm-hmm. point in time, it's, the bigger issue is that your team keeps losing because this is happening and it's a problem. And that's also kind of to tie in those, Irene. That's the thing. You could give them a break in the past because they still won the split. They still got to the finals. Problem is now there's no excuses left. Yeah. Now yeah, now it has to be a problem because it's clearly an issue. Yeah, it, it's a big, I think, systemic issue with them. And like you said, they may not be explicitly saying play tanks or anything like that. But as a jungler, if I have a team and when I go to invade with a aggressive champion and nobody's backing me up, I'm going to be like a fucking Pavlov's dog. I'm going to learn over time. I'm going to be like, wow, this really sucks because I die so quickly before people get to me. So I'm going to start playing tanks because when I play tanks, I get rewarded because I live long enough that my team comes. Yeah, you know, no one actually tells the rat not to go down the hallway that's electrocuted, but he figures it out pretty (laughs) quickly, doesn't he? Like, he doesn't actually need to to communicate with it at all, you know? But I reckon after he dies on his own and then Bjorks is like, what are you doing? I was backing. I think at that point in time, he just learns that, yeah, maybe I won't invade then, you know? Mm -hmm. The plus, to be fair... Like, I don't even blame some of the players for this. This is a coaching issue, in my opinion, generally, yeah, right? Absolutely. It's coaching responsibility. Because to be fair, especially some really good star players, they do focus on their, their own aspect. You know, they are kind of myopic. They have to look at their little role and be excellent at that. It's like, I mean, the obvious best example I always give is like Forgiven, obviously. Because if you were like a jungler and you tried to ask Forgiven, like, well, what should I have done there? Like, you're not going to yeah. like the answer because he's just going to be like, am I supposed to play your role as well? <laughs> it's like, 
Fucking hell. All right, sorry, I asked then. Oh, I guess I'll just go learn my own role. You know, like, like it's just the most unhelpful way you could, like, give the guy the advice, you know. Well, all he really means is, you know, make your own choice or something, you know. But it comes out in the worst possible way, doesn't it? Like, <laughs> yeah. it's like, what do you want from me is what the juggler's saying. Yeah. It's like, it's not that simple. It's like, what do you want from me? Exactly. Then, we need some sort of a cartoon. Someone out there who's got cartoon skills. It's like five different junglers like four of them walking away with like a broken heart like a box of chocolates that's dropping out of their hands flowers and then the last one's just Greg just with Bjergsen like just tell me what you want and he's like I just want a man who knows what he wants <laughs> <laughs> Bjergsen's like the Rapunzel in the tower or something yeah I actually think that I actually think that's so fucking true because they need a jungler that isn't gonna like take shit almost like have a, an ego himself and be like this, this is how we should play the game because they've always been so lane focused just historically as a team like literally you put a jungler on TSM in three months they're going to look exactly the same statistically as every other TSM jungler they're going to look exactly the same performance wise it's literally a plug and play role like if I were to join professional play I'd want to be on TSM because they'd at least make me decent as a pro you'd player. You'd go the other way. You're actually so cynical. Right. You want them to better. boost you. Yeah, yeah, they <laughs> but if you take a jungler who's good and you put him in that position it's going to bring like them down. That, yeah. Like it's the same level regardless of what you, what jungler you pick up, right? So I'm even sitting here going like, I don't think like replacing Grig is a bad, like good idea because it's just the role is going to become that. Now, once you fix the problem of how you're shaping your junglers, then replacing a jungler with something that you want is better. Because I love using Cloud9 as the antithesis here because they look so different with whichever jungler they have, right? Especially because they, they got Sven Skarin as well. Yeah. Right. I mean, they, you bench Senskaren and then you bring in Blabber and it's a different team. Right. The jungler's playing differently. The mid laner's playing differently. The top laner is playing differently. Like everybody plays differently on that team. And then that affects um, that. That just affects how you win and how you end up playing the games out. Like it's more flexible team instead of a rigid style of this is how League of Legends is played. Beep boop. We do this, push that. And then you go like the jungler becomes way more dynamic for a team like uh, Cloud9. Because think about Meteos, completely different play style then. But if T you looked at TSM at that point in time, jungler's still the same. Yeah, Jung still the same. It has not evolved with uh, the players that they've taken up. I don't one hundred percent agree that that C nine like completely changed uh, depending on jungler because I do think that they have their own like jungle specific issues sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, since we're mostly focused on TSM, I think that. I, I mean, it's just it's so weird because. It feels almost like the playstyle that they've sort of learned this split is we know that we're not going to be able to invade with how we're playing with our jungler. So we're basically going to be in a position where we're losing to the point where the enemy team has like this kind of standard roadmap, right? We push towers, push out minions, invade enemy jungle for vision and then so tsm just kind of know that this is the standard roadmap that the enemy yeah. teams have they set up traps in their own jungle they get kills and then eventually they slowly kind of climb out of this hole and this is their their setup so so by the way they play they have to understand the standard roadmap that teams do but they just cannot execute it themselves uh, so it's really interesting to see that. Maybe that's something about the NA mindset, because I've known a few teams in the past who did weird things like that as well. Like they had skilled players. Like a classic example would be if you go all the way back to when St. Vicious used to play on CLG, right? I once did an interview where I said to him, like, why did you want Sin and AMA? Like, yeah, we just like give up Dragon and all the fights. And by the way, this is when they were like a really good team and they're like one of the best NA teams. And they were like, yeah, because the problem is whenever we used to play games, we used to lose a lot of the Dragon fights. And I was like, okay. It was like, so we just decided to just give up dragon i was like that i know that sounds like it makes sense but it actually doesn't make sense at all like if anything doesn't that suggest that you should be working on winning dragon fights which would involve having to take them a lot maybe even like figure out how to set up earlier figure out you know if i like it's like you you found something that pointed a weakness and you're like right that's a weakness get away from that area everyone whereas instead it's like maybe we should fix that weakness no it's no, that no, no same one. uh loss aversion thing yeah it is in a way yeah, you're right. there you go Okay, what about this thing, Kelsey? So a big topic of discussion for obvious reasons, because let's face it, like, first of all, it's not Worlds, so everyone's finished with the three months of Bash and Bjergs, and they all love him again now, the TSM fans. You know, they're back with their boy. And also, Haunts is Haunts, you know, he's just a likable guy. It's not a real way you can talk shit. And then plus, as I did always suggest in his career, 
He's a tank player. You know what? You can't really talk that much shit on tank players. They're not supposed to carry the whole game, are they? Like, what, what, what can they really be doing that much wrong? Anyway, and the jungler's the jungler. Everyone knows the jungler's a whipping boy. So the obvious point of contention, the entire split, has been the bot lane for TSM. And then the, the way it seems to have shaken out in terms of opinions at the moment is most people think that, like, actually Sven's doing all right and he's just in a bad team. But everyone is going in on Mithy. They think he's just been terrible this split. Now, obviously, in the past, he's had times in Europe where he kind of it looked like he took the regular split off or just played a bit shit and then worked himself back into form playoffs, you know, Soaz style in in some past seasons. What do you make of the bot lane aspect, Kelsey? Where do you come down on that? So I was a little bit shaky on Mithy on anything except Alistair, even even last year. Uh, in EU or anything except Alistair and some of the engage picks like maybe Blitzcrank he actually is weirdly good on Blitzcrank things like this where he can find like really really strong like go buttons or engage opportunities and then he just started like he wasn't he wasn't really ever okay I shouldn't say ever but last year beginning especially he wasn't playing extremely well mechanically and as just a bot lane 2v2 dynamic, I didn't think that Sven and Mithy were that strong. I actually felt like even at Worlds, for example, and I, I've read this up before, that Doublelift and Biofrost actually even had a better world showing than Sven and Mithy, just overall in terms of like where they were performing in the 2v2, how they were playing out team fights, um, things like this. Uh, uh, flash memes uh, excluded. But <laughs> uh, so. I was a bit surprised, and I figured it was mostly down to, like, they wanted a strong shot-calling element, and then Mithy was known for that, and that's that's why they picked up the bot lane. So, uh, seeing Mithy not perform extremely well uh, mechanically is not something that I would expect anyone to be surprised by. What I am a bit surprised by is some of the mid-to-late-game calls that G2 were known for. Um, they weren't always, like, incredibly good, but they usually had a form of decisiveness, or they usually made sense. Uh, nothing like this thing that they've now done twice, at least, um, where they're grouping five mid and running it down, and, and then enemy team is taking their, their base uh, through the bot lane. So it's it's just very strange to see them, like almost, it seems like every time TSM make a, make a trade, they don't know how to react to some sort of split pressure, to doing anything except grouping five, and trying to trade sides uh, with a stronger fo s setup. But if the enemy team has any brain, they just take their four and then they defend and they take structures from TSM. So it just feels very weird to see this kind of setup on a team where, okay, we're, we're, we're bringing in Sven and Mithy who are supposed to be known for, like Mithy especially is known for his leadership in game. And then we're, we're seeing this kind of like weird macro play from TSM that just feels bad. Uh, in general to watch. Well, I mean, the obvious examples, Irene, for that is this game they had against, I think it was the Echo Fox game, right? Where Hunter yeah. even said in the interview afterwards, like, oh, we weren't aware they could actually finish the game then. Which, yeah, have the like, admittedly, we're watching the whole map, etc. But that does seem a bit bizarre to, like, when you're getting towards the end of the split. Yeah, they had it happen twice. There's like FlyQuest and Echo Fox. Like, what did you think? Like, it... It honestly feels really interesting, but I will say that uh, one thing that people need to consider too is that they have multiple voices on that team that seem to be conflicting, and Mithy maybe has the override. But if he's making the wrong calls, then that's that's just a big shot calling issue in terms of his judgment, and he needs to fail at that in order to get better. Like failure is how he's going to grow. Is if if he messes that up then he's going to realize for next time and maybe make the right call. And I think that's kind of the thing is when people screw up like that, you don't want to just shit all over them because they're going to know what they did wrong. Granted, it happened twice. Uh, and I also think another thing too is we've nerfed inhibitor turrets and nexus turrets HP. So they're actually the easiest turrets to take in the game right now. So I think it we're seeing a lot of base races because people have to readjust kind of how much HP everything has. Because it, it had like 300 on inhibitor turrets and like, like 900 off of both the Nexus turrets. So there's like 1,800 less HP on the Nexus turrets. So you, there's not as much HP, and so you kind of get into a rush really quickly. I'm going to stop you there. Base race mm -hmm. is a never good idea, okay? You can just, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Like, literally <laughs> see from a numbers advantage. Someone's going to win that, okay? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. 
but it's uh, I, I do know what you mean. It's like they're they're having trouble adjusting, and I just think in general, like I don't exactly know how I go from like watching EU and how normal EU teams behave and then going to okay this is how we're going to play against NA teams because it feels really weird like if you're constantly playing in that environment it's it's so strange like I actually think the NA meta is significantly different from like EU LCK and LPL and LMS like more so than any other region and so what way? they're you mean like the way that they hit the game like, the way they play it picks just mostly the way that the macro is played out uh, in particular, and there's much more of a tendency to group in NA, which like obviously has become a meme. It's the NA RAM. Yeah, the NA RAM. But uh, it's it's just I I don't even like okay someone suddenly split pushing and then you haven't played against this in ages. Uh, like how do you react? And I feel like TSM are falling a little bit behind. Like I actually think that optics, some of optics improvements, because I I thought that they were one of the worst like side laning teams in NA in spring, but, but now they're one of the better ones. So I think that a lot of optics improvements have actually come from that. Um, and so just like reacting to a team like Echo Fox, a team like Optic, um, doing that type of uh, macro and then you haven't seen it for a while in NA uh, feels weird. So. Okay, what about this then? So a team I def I, we're not going to get to cover all the teams. I wanted to just mm. like do a deep dive on a few, you know. So what I definitely want to talk about is Cloud Nine, one you referenced earlier. Zion, oh, can, can I they, can I just say one more thing? Oh about yeah, sure. GSM? Yeah, sure. Um, is I I as a jungler, like I just want to talk on this one more time. The the jungler issue is it, this is going to resonate with a lot of people in terms of junglers because you will get flamed so much playing jungle and solo queue because everybody wants your attention. You go bottom lane, your top laner dies, and they're going to flame the shit out of you. But I think on TSM, what ends up happening is he gets pulled everywhere, so he's actually nowhere. They have like really, they have bottom three in like Drake control, Herald control, uh, Drake's per game, like first turret, their last, I think, in the entire league. Like they are pulling him everywhere, so he's doing nothing. But also if their shot caller is a bottom laner and their bottom lane is playing passive, then it's like, where, how is the support going to know that he can gank top or gank mid? Like the jungler needs to figure out what he's going to do. And as a jungler, you sometimes need to be an asshole to people and just be like, there's no fucking way I'm playing to your lane. It's a losing matchup. I'm going top. Good luck. Like you have to be an asshole sometimes to play the game correctly. And I think that that's something that TSM junglers have lacked is telling people no on that team and figuring out what they're going to do. So I think that's something that needs fixing. Okay. Right. And so anyway, yeah, let's talk about Cloud9 then. Because yep. obviously the team went from bottom of the league. We all know the drama they had with taking out all the big name players. Now they made the swap, as you said, of the jungler. They brought in Blabber instead of Sven Skaren. They've won four games in a row now. Admittedly, three of them were against some of the bottom teams, but they won against Echo Fox. Right. What do you, where do you, where's Cloud9 at? Like, is this trajectory actually going to continue? And now when they play the other good teams, are they going to go ahead and make worlds? I think so. I actually think that they're going to be able to make worlds. Like they, there's this group of TSM Optic and TSM Optic Cloud9 and CLG that their remaining schedule is actually uh, pretty interesting. Where I think like CLG stands a really good chance of making it. TSM has an okay one. Optic is like pretty decent too. But I think Cloud9 stand a really good chance, especially in the form that they're in right now, because I think Blabberfish and Jensen have just had a really good combination. Like Blabberfish has, I think, one of the highest KPs for junglers across the league as a really new player, which means that he's getting directed across. And I think his damage percentage is is the highest. He's got like 100 more DPM than like almost any other jungler. Like he is doing absolute work on this team. And he is, uh, basically there's a story here where I remember when I was thinking maybe they should bench Sven Skarin after some of his tank Gragas and like uh, Trundle games where he got caught late game. And I remember looking up and being like, wait, Jensen's solo queue. He's duoing with Blabber. Like Jensen was stuck Diamond 2 and then he got boosted by Blabber basically. Like they just duoed all the way to Challenger with Blabber, somebody who is in uh, scouting grounds and he's a top solo queue player. So he has that solo queue mentality of how to carry. And I think that's something that's really good for C9 because Blabber knows where he needs to play. And then Jensen can play supportive around him. Oriana, Zillion, Lulu. He's even played like a Lulu mid game, right? So it's like these are champions that I think are, are fantastic for their style because their jungler is way more aggressive than other junglers in the league, uh, except for maybe Dardoch. So I, I think it's a complete resurgence here. Granted, Sneaky, love him. 
Uh, Sneaky and Lane was a big meme before, and I think it is now again. Like Sneaky and Zazel aren't doing particularly well, and that's kind of the weaker part. But like Licorice looks like a top two top laner in the league. Blabber looks like a top two top three jungler, and then Jensen looks like a top two mid laner right now. So I think like their top half of the map is one of the strongest in the entire league, and they can play off that. So I think playoffs is some. I, I think they make playoffs. Okay. Sure. I mean that 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 wouldn't be surprising to me. I think that C nine playing in terms of mid jungle synergy is has always sort of been like where they sort of trend to. the The issue is is like what their side lanes do when jungle and mid are playing together. Um, I've always felt like their coordination between mid jungle and then their sides is is a little bit awkward um and so that's like where i feel like c9 i I disagree slightly with your argument that c9 are a completely different team depending on jungle because i think that that present is that the problem is still present with blabber but uh, i do think that blabber has been like maybe even not even a drastic play style shift it's just probably been a big confidence boost for this team right you have someone who's willing to take responsibility to go in and say this is my call this is what we're doing and then so so suddenly this team looks way better and i think that that's that's been a big a good thing for c9 so mm. uh, I, I think uh just to push back a little bit on that uh argument is i think c9 look different in terms of their jungle mm-hmm. regardless of which jungler they have or re- regarding which jungler they have they always look a little different I think the mid style stays the same of once they hook up with the mid laner. Jensen's not like an intense roaming bottom lane, top lane, like jungler, right? It's a uh, uh, mid laner. So I think like the mid style stays relatively the same when it's a mid laner type situation. I think the jungler situations change based on the jungler. So it's not like a plug and play type thing. But I think since Jensen has been pretty consistent, uh, that's what that's what you, his like tendencies are the same. Because when Golden Glue was in, they were like going mid lane and they, uh, bottom lane afterwards. So they were like, playing off of mid more in that sense and i don't think they that jensen does that that much so i think that's less of a like jungler thing and more of like a mid laner thing because that's been a pretty consistent thing for jensen in general yeah i think that was one of jensen's big developments was just uh he plays much better about his his, around his jungler like he's not going to roam on prio or like do fake pressure insanely well but he if his jungler wants to go in and take a camp or his jungler wants to go in and kill the enemy jungler he will be there um so i think that that's a really big thing for jensen in his current iteration so yeah right so one team i actually wanted to get your thoughts on we're not obviously we've done tsm so we're not just only doing the best teams it's actually (laughs) going to be a weird one it's going to be clg because i know people actually I mean, to be fair, CLG fans haven't had a lot to really get excited about for a while, but people actually got excited about this team over the last few weeks because they did get That's a mistake. Some inexplicable near wins. Now, they turned some of them into losses, and obviously they had some wins earlier in the split, but even some of them were like a bit ropey at best, you know? Like, this lineup is one where I don't think anyone looks at it and says, like, this should be a top team. Like, it does look as though the organization itself has made some decisions that I would just suggest are more like a little bit conservative, you know, like we're not going to take big gambles on players and big signings and stuff, right? What do, what accounts for, for some of the bizarre sort of brief resurgence and some of the some of the, t- the times when they've managed to at least make it look good? Because to be fair, at least when they got stomped in the past, it, it was fairly convincing, you know, they, they didn't look very, very good as a team at all. So what do you think of the current CLG designing? Well, a six-game loss streak for me just signals a lot of problems. Like Rainover controls the early parts of the game, and I'm, uh, I'll talk about what I know, and that's junglers. I think Rainover struggles in a post no tracker's knife era, where once he starts getting a lead, he was a vision controlled track the other jungler type jungler. And Biofrost is about roaming and not always about vision control. And I think Rainover can't contribute as much to those types of things anymore. And so he gets a little lost because Rainover, in my mind, is less of a gambling jungler and more of a full knowledge and with some assumptions jungler, where once you're trying to split push or something, you set up the appropriate wards on the top side and the middle part of the map, the map, and then you can play around that. Now you don't have that many wards available to you, and so you have to go with some level of assumed knowledge, and it's way higher than before. And a lot of the times the assumptions are coming up incorrect or they're being paralyzed by it where they're like, well, we don't know where these two people are. They could be here, and then they end up not being there. Or when they end up both coming to top lane and like ganking a side laner, then it's like, well, 
now we can't react as fast because you used to be able to see those people collapsing on it and choke people out with vision and end the game. So they're getting early leads. They're one of the best early game teams in the league, but their capitalization on it, I think, is they're trying to play too safe in a meta where you have to take more risks. So it's it's interesting that you, you would characterize them as a good early game team because I don't necessarily disagree. Like if you just look at pure gold amounts, but where they're getting their leads is basically off of cheese ganks and kills. And they feel like a team that is just playing much more for killing everyone and champions are objectives than uh, actually controlling the map. And that's not necessarily how it feels like they're going to the game because CLG has always been a team like regardless of what their jungler is at like planning out level one and level twos uh, fairly well. And so setting that up and I feel like at the start of the split we were in a meta where that was really effective. You know, uh, we were in a position where that allowed you to take control of the game. But as the split has gone on and we've had balance changes and other teams have just like gotten better at sort of absorbing some early game pressure, uh, we're in positions where, okay, yes, he gets first blood, that's great, um, but he's not translating that into dragons. He's not translating that into turrets. And the other team stalls out and is able to have like better setups and vision control and CLG are floundering quite a bit more. Okay. It, it, just uh, in terms of if you were playing like fantasy GM, you know, not necessarily what they should do, but what like you would do if like you controlled the team or whatever. Is there an obvious like position they need an upgrade at or a different type of player? What do you think, Zyrene? Hmm. Like I feel like like that bot lane's a bit mismatched, you know. You think I've so? Really been feeling. Hmm. It. Really, I actually think like at the beginning, Stixie and Bowfrost were looking like one of the strongest bottom lanes. Um. Hmm. That, that's interesting that you say that because I, I think during the first half for sure they were definitely my top two, okay. top three for bottom lanes. And sure, they've fallen off a little bit. I think, to be completely frank, it may be like if I was general manager, I'd try to like I love Zix, but I'd probably bring on somebody else as a coach to like sure. check these things because yeah. I think their drafts win conditions have been really not one dimensional, but very narrow in terms of there's very little fallback plan for them. And I think when you aren't a team that likes to pressure and play off of objectives like Kelsey was saying and close the game out, you you can't let the game go on too long and you need more yeah. you may need more like win conditions that are easily accessible. So things like I, I think they did like a, a AD Kennen, they did like a Renekton mid, they did a Kled mid at one point, and that was that was fun. Uh and so there's a lot of things that I've I've had issues with draft wise, and I'd probably just bring in a, a double checker for mid lane. Or for a coaching position, I think that's pretty fair though. Because to be like, I noticed one thing the I don't... Freudian split on mid lane. Because yeah, I know that's probably I... <laughs> that's probably where I'd go. Uh, so. The thing is though, I like to be fair, Zyrene, I often say this about coaches: like, if you lose enough and you have enough seasons that aren't that good, it's not even relevant anymore whether you're a good coach. You just either you don't have a very good team, in which case. I mean, you should probably leave anyway if you get the option, you know. Like, what's the point in having a really good coach and a bad team that can't do anything? Or you just don't match your team anymore. Like, maybe yeah. you just can't get through them anymore. Or, you've done, or they don't fit your style. You know, they have nice personnel. Because, you know, I mean, think about how long Zix has been there now. And the last few seasons have just kind of been idling away, like barely a playoff team. At this point, either he's a good coach, in which case he can go to another team and do something great in another chapter, or they need a new coach regardless. Like, it feels like, I kind of agree. I think eventually, I, I've said the same thing about Reaper at times, because bear in mind, Cloud9 tries to stack up their team with potential champions every set. To me, it's not good enough to go, yeah, but we're always pretty good, you know? We're always, like, kind of making top four. It's like, yeah, but what's the expectations for your team? What personnel did you have? You know, eventually, someone's got to win with this team. So if it can't be you, someone it's got to be someone else then. Kelsey, so, so you, okay, you were suggesting the obvious classic throwback. Get who he the fuck out of there. See, I don't even necessarily think who he is like a bad player, and I think that they've gone through great lengths where he he fits with CLG very well. But the thing well, is, he literally is that started I think... at the bottom, and now he's here. He's done it. He's, you know, he's started <laughs> with such low expectations. Now, yeah, you look, he's gone not bad. Yeah, not bad. Son. See, uh, like CLG, who he has a very heavy roaming play style, and that's part of why they're able to get early like kills and setup 
works very well is that who he moves around the map, but that's also why they're so reliant on them as well, I think, because you're not going to be in a position where if the enemy team just pushes out mid, like maybe who he loses two waves and you can't, and you lose so much pressure on the map off of that. If like the side lane roam or invade or whatever you're doing doesn't work. And I don't know if that's something that they've restricted on themselves because of who he or if who he has just learned to play that way by a coaching staff or by a team setup, but changing that out or just making getting maybe a second mid laner to come in a bit more or something like this might might help them come up with new ways to like look for more objective oriented plays. Mm, I I hard disagree on the who he thing. He's He's been like 2v8ing their last few games. Like he's been doing incredibly well. And it's been a, more on Darshan, I would say, on the side lane. Sure. And sure, maybe he doesn't get like the jungle attention that who he does. But I don't think that's, uh, that's on who he. I think this is a coaching staff issue. I think this is more of a uh, how they're going to play the game type issue. Because I think that all these players are capable of doing well in playoffs and making playoffs. I just think that getting them to mesh and figure out how they're going to play League of Legends is appropriate. Because they floundered a lot. Like, who he gives away his leads, right? Then they tried him on a lot of champions, like with the Renekton, the Kled, etc. Mm -hmm. um, where they're like, let's try to get a, li a lead mid. And then it like didn't work out when they tried to overly pressure mid. Because like the ganks failed or the matchup wasn't good. Like There's a lot that goes on there. And I feel like it's not that simple as like replacing who he and trying to make it... Um, I mean, I like I said, I don't, I wouldn't blame who he for this. And like again, it's it's going back to the Western versus Asian mentality of uh, oh, we're benching the player. Does that mean we think who he is garbage and that this guy is? But no, it just means that mm -hmm. I think that the team needs a different way to think about the game. And that's why I think I, coaching staff is more no, the issue than but the player. I think that even changing coaching staff though, like you're not going to have a huge profound impact on the way the players themselves are thinking about the game as much as you will changing players uh, is really how I feel about it. And I don't mean... Well, to technically, you, you are logically entirely sound there, Kelsey. If you change the players, then the players will be thinking differently about the yeah, game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, you can't argue with them on that uh, one. <laughs> exactly. They will be thinking differently about the No, but I, I think like even the players that you're not changing will be forced to kind sure. of adapt to a new situation. Unless you're and, TSM. Yeah, whereas... And he's replacing well, the jungle. Okay, let's put it this way. TSM is defined by a certain player um, and a certain role. So He is still there. When She's still saying Benjamin Bjergsen! No. <laughs> Listen, Maybe I am. Stop <laughs> criticizing him. Oh, Stop God. criticizing him. Leave Bjergsen alone. <laughs> but uh, I do think that th that is a point to make, is that a lot of teams are defined to an extent by how X player in X position plays. And I think to an extent, CLG is kind of defined by how who he plays. And sometimes they play for super like hard counter lane priority matchups. Like I think for me, the most famous CLG example is going to be Fiora Galio. It's not going to be really in Seoul, but it's going to be like when they played Fiora into Galio, because this is the lane matchup that allowed them to get priority, that allowed them to do this kind of thing where they're rotating across the map. And they go to these kinds of lengths to get mid prio is that a who he issue is that a coaching staff issue is that a philosophy on the game issue if you swap out who he just just maybe for a week or like a couple games does he see what the other mid laner is playing does he get an idea does the team like gain a new perspective from that and then he comes back in again and they play differently you know maybe even with who he so um, that's why I think that actually changing mid could act, could do a lot for CLG, even more than Darshan, because even though Darshan maybe isn't the best player on the team, I don't necessarily feel like they play super hard around him. Mm -hmm. Like I would say that. So NA, this is this is a fun fact, is the only major region that count, last picks their mid laner on red side more than a top laner. Right now, in this split, every other region last picks their top laner almost twice as much as and it, as they do in as they do their second like highest last pick roll. Um, NA last picks mid almost as uh, about as much as top, but a little bit more mid. Uh, so to me, that says a lot about how NA views the game and how they set up their macro. So they don't really 
player on top, they don't want four as much. They don't want three one. They don't value like getting counter pick on top that much and having like a strong sideliner as the game progresses. And so for me, changing out Darshan doesn't change that much because CLG probably still won't be a team that like really gets good use out of their top laner, you know? Maybe they will be. Maybe they completely change, but like I felt like Optic was the worst top lane side laning team last split and now it's CLG. So <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, that, that's kind of how I, I go about the who he or Darshan equation there. Hmm. Yeah, that's weird because like, yeah, sorry, yeah. He, this is this is former Zion Spartan, right? This is like the guy yeah, who yeah. was the push and like AFK yeah, from the yeah. team. He was like, like the, the Jax, the... the Nasus, like, Nasus, yeah. yeah, everything player. So it, it's yeah. really funny to think about that, but, it, he's, but it's interesting. he's really not that... It, it's almost to the point where like he's misplaying his champions that he isn't doing that, you know? So yeah. Like, if I were to say, like, maybe, like, swap anybody out, it would probably be Darshan. But at the same time, I think, like, coaching staff realigning and, like, Rainover has played with motherfucking Huhi or Huni and Huhi now. He's played with Huni and he knows what to do to get a top laner ahead. And if he can get Darshan on that same page, they can play through that because they tried to play through Darshan yesterday and it just failed miserably. Or, like, yesterday or two days ago with the Kennen, it just failed miserably. Like, he got completely shut down. And everybody else is doing well. But, but well, once again, I think those are like drafts where yeah. it's very one dimensional, no fallback plan. And then I also think it's the fact that the team is not playing around that. I, I don't think like if you can get who to play a certain way and just be like, yo, you're not going to get jungle attention. I think that's something that you can accomplish. Like, I don't think who he's going like has a magnet that the jungler has to come to him to get in mid prio and they rely on that. Like you can train through over and over again in resilience and repetition that this guy's going to go elsewhere and that we have other strategies. And I think that's the thing is they haven't diversified enough in strategies. And I don't think changing players is really the answer to that. Imagine if that was actually your solo lens, though, the nightmare communication scenario that would be. Ooh. You'd have to just use first names or something, wouldn't you? It'd be like impossible. <laughs> hoony, <laughs> hoony, the, hoony. Exactly. Imagine <laughs> the level of fucking clusterfuck you'd have on like invades there's, and stuff. <laughs> and there's a support player in China who is also <coughs> named Hoony. So just put them all on the same <laughs> just team. Get them all on the same team. I I think they use first names a lot anyway. Like they call him Jay or and stuff. Right. For, uh, okay. Ui. I think that that was a change that a lot of teams did because it was more personal, right? Yeah. That's why Darshan changed. Also, to be fair, like I'd just combine both of your opinions. I'd probably just say when you're as bad a team as CLG has been for the last few years, just do both. <laughs> just fire the coach and get rid of one of these players, get another player in. And I'm just making wholesale changes basically. Damn. Don't be- don't believe in people's ability to grow or change. Don't trust <laughs> people. Just, you know, maybe that reveals more about all of our different personalities. I don't know. It might, mm-hmm. might be some level there, right? So for a, cause we're running out of time. So limited, I've got a limited amount of time for this one. I'll give you the options, Irene. This mm-hmm. is the Sophie's choice moment. Cause okay. you can pick which of the last teams we talk about. There's two teams I'm going to offer you. It can either be a hundred thieves at one point in time, the best team in the league, or it can be Echo Fox. We're taking Echo Fox. <laughs> Good, good, good choice. I prefer it myself. More of a tantalizing <laughs> team, isn't it? Okay, so why why did you pick Uncle Fox first of all? Uh, no bias. No, I, I really love watching them play. That's the thing. Is hundred thieves and also hundred thieves is boring as fuck. Yeah, well, I mean, they have some day and some day. <laughs> some day is really great. I he just does is, what he does. Yeah, yeah. Some day is actually having like an incredible split. Just reminds me of like oh, his beast, LCK yeah. performances. And thank fucking god he's back to that. Like, good lord. And I'd rather just talk about Echo Fox because they made recent changes too with Lost and Smoothie. And the team no longer looks like it's Hooney's team. He's the worst player on this team performance-wise right now. Like, normally Hooney's teams are like, you know what a bottom lane is? He's like, no, that, that shit's got gangrene. We're cutting that off. Tourniquet that shit. No bottom lane exists on my team. Now they finally have a bottom lane that they can play through. And Hooney's been feeding and they've still been winning. And I, I just think, like, this team has the potential to be number one and potentially perform the best internationally out of the North American teams. Because I think the top three... Potentially, I have a lot of issues that can come up in uh, international tournaments where I think uh, Echo Fox, if they're able to make it to Worlds, which, you know, based off championship points and standings and stuff, I think they will. Uh, I think that this is a team that can actually perform well, despite having two people who are relatively new to the international stage. Or three, I guess, if you want to count Dardock and, you know, just did Rift Rivals, but he performed really well there. Come on, Kelsey. Oh, I know! Uh, I know you're going to bring all the high prices. Come on, come on. I, 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 just throw I the figured, hot, throw you know, the cold water so, on him. Come go on. on, let's go. 
I mean, but I mean, I mean, well for NA, like they'll win one more game in groups and still not make it out. You know, just. I I mean, Agrobox are 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 interesting because I feel like. Uh, it's a good word. Yeah, I, I I feel like this team just cares so little about how the map is set up most of the time. They just kind of go for it. Yeah, and uh, so if you're talking about how teams perform internationally, Echo Fox is maybe not my number one pick from NA, but at the same time, it, it's almost everyone I talk to about NA performances is like, oh, this year is doomed. More than any other year, this year is doomed. Uh, so either we're, we're in a position where NA performs better than ever, because obviously that's how these things go, or it's just just awful so then then we do look to echo fox because maybe they just cheese the shit out of everyone but like for me echo fox are doing stuff like constantly pushing past vision lines um they're without like any setup getting caught out like they're they're they were the tsm versus echo fox game was one of my favorites to think of stylistically because tsm like, they do exactly what TSM wants them to do. It's like, we're just going to go for it, and then we'll get caught in the jungle, where we'll die, and there's so much back and forth. So that was, like, just kind of a really fun game to watch uh, from if you if you like messages. And I, I think that, hmm, like, they have improved their overall setup of Baron Vision in terms of just making sure they have River Vision uh, before they're, they're pushing forward, but not necessarily securing the area behind Baron, um, I, I do think that in terms of just having like really strong players though, this is a much better lineup. Like you said, you have way better ways to play around bot side. I actually always like Echo Fox's drafts, to be honest. Um, I think their drafts are good. I think that they're one of the few teams that's actually thought about how do we, how do we maximize, maximize efficiency in terms of resource allocation, in terms of economizing. I feel like NA is one of the, the worst regions in terms of economizing, not just in-game, but out-of-game, just in general, in terms of like efficiently spending their money, efficiently making sure everyone is catching waves and pushing the right amount of minions. But I feel like Echo Fox actually are pretty good at that aspect of the game. Um, so like in that sense, I, I like Echo Fox a lot. I think that... Uh, the fact that we're seeing some of Huni's weaknesses actually does say nice things about NA, though, uh, overall, because, like, he's always had these weaknesses. He's had these weaknesses in LCK. We saw them on the world stage. We saw him get punished for this. So the fact that he's getting punished for them much more means that maybe Echo Fox will, will run through the trials and tribulations, the, the, the labors of Hercules, and we'll see a, a great team by the end of the gauntlet or playoffs or whatever happens to make them qualify. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I do like... I, I, I like the idea of Echo Fox, but there's just so much stuff that they do that... Yeah. Yeah, that just is, it's a bit of a head-scratcher, you know? So. I, lo I love them so much, though. Like... This team, I was just looking at some stats for them. They're lowest in the entire league for wards per minute, lowest <laughs> for vision wards per minute. They're second lowest in wards cleared, but they're highest in damage per minute. Like Echo Fox <laughs> motto is we don't need to know where the enemy is with yeah. wards if we're fighting them. Like that's what they do is they're just like, we, these fuckers are all under turret. They're all like in the jungle. We're fighting. They don't yeah. need to know where they are. They just need to fight them. That's all they have no, to do. Ironically, like the uh, Svenskeren and rated. <clears throat> SK motto, so yeah. there you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, the moving ward. Yeah. No, that's that's the approach, isn't it? Like you, you don't need to know where the other jungler is if your jungler has like six kills. Yeah. At that also, point in time, it's pretty good. It's going pretty well for you. It's going to be hard for them yeah. to invade. And I think that's why Huni's being exploited so much right now because he has like I think it's the season five. Uh, SKT Faker type mentality where it was <laughs> I don't need to know where the enemy jungler is if he's ganking me. Where yes. it was, you're playing past the halfway line in your lane up in front, and you're basically saying, if I'm getting ganked, we get to make a play somewhere else. So Huni is forcing you to gank him, and granted, he's not surviving these ganks. He's putting his team in a hole, so he does need to reel it back a little bit, a whole bunch, and have the like vision control. But it's where he's forcing somebody to come to him to deal with him, or he's just a ticking time bomb. You can shut him down, but now that he has a team that is actually doing stuff with Demonte, Lost, and Smoothie, then... There are good things that are happening on the map that makes it a not Echo Fox 
don't, like it's not just Huni's team, right? Like that's the thing is Huni has always been kind of the exclamation point on this team, and sure. now he's a bit of a question mark, but they're still finding success, and I think that is really good sign for them. And I still love Huni. He's still playing basically the same way he always has. I don't think he's gotten worse. I think he just needs to learn a few new habits, right? And his Kelsey. team is actually just like mm-hmm. making making a uh, use of what he does. Has adding smoothie been a game changer? I mean, I think smoothie is still the best for NA. So, if you're adding him to a team, I think it naturally just makes them better. Um, in most cases, because support is a role where, if the support is good mechanically and uh, smart, like you can't really go wrong because he'll be able to fill whatever hole uh, that you have. It's not like adding. Like the sickest ADC, it's not it's not like on the same level, and then forcing the ADC to play around you. I don't think this with his support, it's the same level. So, like yeah, he, he will just make the the team better. Also, I feel like obviously there are way less champion pool issues yeah. uh, with their current bottom lane, so that that is very helpful as well. Yeah. I've got to give props to Jack, by the way, because in other games like CS, Jack has actually been very willing to let some of his good players go to other teams like when they got a bigger offer, you know. And so I feel like what he did with Smoothie was, it's like where, you know, you get let out of prison early if you've got a good behavior, you know. So <laughs> he was like, right, listen, you've suffered enough. You, you can go now. Because that, that trade made no sense to me whatsoever, but whatever. It's done yeah. now. Like, what do you uh, think, Tyreen? I, I know Andy personally, Smoothie, and like I, I talked to him a whole bunch. He was very, like, unhappy with his situation he wasn't benched for like motivation issues he was more like quote unquote collateral damage slash they liked the way that zazel didn't flood comms because smoothie's a big controller of shot calling and him and dardock on a team together i think does wonders for them because now there's somebody to like double check dardock dardock doesn't have to focus as much on shot calling and just gets to be a mechanical monster and and smoothie does a lot of the lifting there i think that jack you know did the right thing for the players i think that smoothie is like just think about his career this guy was on TDK, 10th place, auto-relegated. Then he got picked up by TL, played a single game, got benched for Matt. Then he got picked up by Cloud9, had to fight Bunny Fufu for his spot, and then won the spot. Then he got benched and said, I'm going to a different team. And can you help me with that? Because he's always wanted starting spots. He's not somebody who deserves to sit on a bench. And his mentality is that he wants to play League of Legends professionally, and he will always take feedback. He's one of the best people at taking feedback that I know. And that's why I'm a little bit concerned with him on Echo Fox in the long run, is that he's going to be more of a feedback receptive machine, where if Huni and Dardock are like telling him that he did this wrong, he'll be like, okay, okay. And then I don't know how much he's going to push back and try to make them better, as much as he's going to try to be like, oh, I can improve myself so that they can play off me and they can play better, instead of trying to adjust people around him. Smoothie's more of somebody who shapes himself to a team, as opposed to has the team shape around him in any way. So that's my concern in the long run, but I think he's a really good pickup, and I think he's a really good player, too. So Kelsey, he's good, good from Jack. Should my boy Dardock be an MVP candidate this split? I think so. I think that Equifax should have always played standard. I'm not really sure what they were doing for most of the split, honestly, other than uh, we have about... it worked like a couple of times and you can tell that made them just believe it was actually going to work more. I mean, I can almost see that they were, okay, we're in a meta where our ADC has to play more champions than any other player and our ADC hardly had a champion pool to begin with. So I can see an issue where it's like, uh, okay, what kind of cheese can we do to get around the fact that our bottom lane probably can't adapt to the meta so that's probably what their thought process sort of was whether con- probably more like subconsciously not explicitly said and uh so they went for stuff like funnel they went for stuff like huni swapping to jungle and everything else so uh but i think that the fact that you can see a drastic difference between how aquafox plays is standard and how aquafox played doing all that that speaks to the fact that Dardock is performing well and could be considered an MVP candidate, yes. If if Echo Fox end up winning the split, for sure. Or just case, make it to like top whatever, however as high as yes. they can make it. They can make it to first or something by the end of well, regular season because NA is so messed up in standing as well, as I think. And it's all weird, yeah. Dardock. That's like an MVP trophy. You heard it there, <laughs> Clip that, put it on your fucking... 
Instagram page, whatever you need to do with it, son. There you go. Whether you win it or not. What do you think, Zyra? Is the MVP candidate? I've never he was a bad player, anyway. No, no, why would, why, would, why would you suggest that? All I'm saying is, you know, like Arcadia and Mike Young, it's not really working out so well. <laughs> anyway, let's not bring that up again. It's almost at the end of the episode. I have to end it. Zyrene, mm. please. Uh, no, I think he's definitely an MVP candidate. I think that Dardock, even just excluding his Rift Rivals performances, because you can't really factor those into regular season MVP voting, I still think he's an MVP candidate. I think it's him, Someday, and Doublelift are my top three right now in terms of MVP, with POE also being up there. Like, these three guys have done fantastic work, but I think that Dardock in particular is somebody that he just had his worst game of the split last, like, yesterday. That was his worst game. They still ended up winning, but it really, Dardock is somebody that I think defines his team and can help. And it's crazy because he's on a team with Huni where he has so much leverage there. And we've always wanted somebody who can, like, kind of work alongside Huni instead of be like Huni's bitch, somebody who can actually tell him no and go other places on the map. And now with a team where like, that's a, that's the funny thing to me is he looked like an MVP candidate on a team that was literally jungler has one lane he can play to. And now he's going to look even better when he has three lanes he can play to because his decisions be, can become more clever and he's less readable by the enemy team, right? Because before Echo Fox used to be we, when you're playing against them, we're going to go top lane. We're going to try to shut down Huni, and Dardock will probably be there. Here's the two on two, right? You have to win two on two and, or decide to go somewhere else. Now, when you go top lane, Dardock's actually like winning other parts of the map or screwing your jungler over with invades that can get vision for later. Like he's doing way more now, and we're seeing a new dimension to him on this team. So I think right now, he looks like an MVP candidate in the top three, but I think in the next two weeks, he has the chance to make himself look like he's number one. Okay. Right, Alternatively, oh, sorry, he, go on. Alternatively he ganked mid at three minutes every single game because if he didn't, bad things would happen. Anyway, continue. Yeah. This video was kindly supported by Dean Tanglis, Gardner Wilson, Andreas Snazor Westerland, Alex Adams, Eddie Wingfors, Daniel Yordanov, Robert Baxter, Travis Greb, Kyla Harris, James Harding, Cesar, and special thanks go out to Matt Schakowsky and Jerky's Minion in particular. Want teasers for my upcoming content? How about asking me a question for my monthly AMA? Do you want to take part in a discussion about esports with me? How about suggesting a topic or a guest for my content? Put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today.